Hey, everyone. You know the guest of today's flashback episode from Charmed, Melrose Place, My Name is Earl, and a lot more. Here's Alyssa Milano. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. I am so thrilled to be talking with you today. Oh, you're so sweet. I'm so excited to be speaking to you. I love the podcast. I love you. I love you. And I am so impressed by your activism. I can only imagine how many people would thank you if they could. So thank you. It's been a, an honor to be of service to to people, to the country, and, you know, it's not for everyone, and I completely respect that, um, but it means so much that you're supportive, so thank you. Will you tell us about Sorry Not Sorry, your book? Yes, I would love to. So, you know, I started writing it, and then the pandemic hit, and I got seriously ill with COVID in the very, very beginning. And it was the time when, you know, they were sending out weird swabs, nasal swabs for the testing. We couldn't find masks anywhere. I mean, it was just, you know, uh, catastrophic. When you first felt symptoms, like back then, did you think you had a flu? Or I was diagnosed with pneumonia because the tests that I had taken were incomplete. It was so early on in the pandemic, they were still trying to figure out the testing for it. And it wasn't until they came out with the antibody test, you know, the blood test through your arm, not the finger blood test, that my antibodies were through the roof, which was, I would say, about three months after my acute illness. And then all of a sudden, everything made sense. And I actually felt so much better in knowing that you know, because I had long hauler symptoms up until recently, actually. And so I was almost relieved that it was that. Otherwise, I was like, how does one get this sick? <laughs> right. Because I've never been like that before in my life. It literally, on a, it impacted every part of my body. So if you can imagine sinus, chest, ears, joint pain, I couldn't remember words, smells were off. I mean, it was just, I'd never been that sick before. And I was like, if this is pneumonia and I'm getting all of these other symptoms, it just didn't make sense to me. So when I finally got, you know, the antibody test, I was like, okay. And so once that happened, the trajectory of what I was going to write for the book completely changed because obviously my life changed so much. And I think, you know, before I was ill, it was going to be really focused on my activism and my advocacy work and sort of using that as a mirror to who I am. And it then, after the sickness, expanded to be more about me and my life and my career and the activism is presented in a way of this is this is who I am and this is what I believe in and here's why. So it became a lot more personal. And I can tell you that like it's terrifying because I think there's a certain amount of, and I'm sure you could relate to this, there's a certain amount of sacredness to certain aspects of who I am that I've held sort of close to my chest because I've I feel like we need to keep something for ourselves. And through the essays, I wasn't allowed to feel, and it was my own not allowing myself to feel like I was bullshitting anybody or protecting yes. a part of me. And so it really became so very personal. And so that's how it ended up. And it's a book of essays. And I talk about everything from childbirth to living in South Africa for three months in 2000. It's just a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I've been really looking forward to this. And Alyssa, I can't imagine the courage it takes to do everything you're doing with your activism. What are the hardest parts? I mean, there's a lot to unpack with that question, but I think the hardest part and this might be surprising to some people about what the hardest part is, but the hardest part for me is actually having so much invested in the potential outcome of what I'm fighting for and how utterly heartbreaking it is 
when we're not able to fulfill something super specific. And it becomes a love affair, really. It's like a love affair. And when you're not able to have a result that you intended, your heart is broken. And I think it is why so many hardcore grassroots activists die so young. They die young because, like, they expanded their heart and it's been broken so many times that they just can't, their body is just like enough. And it, you know, they'll have heart attacks and then they'll die of unknown causes and then they'll go in for the autopsy and they'll, like, literally their heart will be swollen. And I think it's because it's hard work and we don't really ever see the result, right? Like, I think of Alice Paul who wrote the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923, right after the suffragettes movement. And we still haven't seen women and equality in our founding document, right? And this is something that she fought for her entire life and passed away not seeing it come into fruition. So I think part of it is like you have to be okay to let go of the outcome, but also you have to be okay with like just planting the seed and hoping that somebody is going to pick the fruit from the tree that you grew. And so that part's really hard. And then, you know, trolling is obviously hard. Well, this is what I also wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> yeah. <It's> like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have to sort of, and believe me, I came to this through a lot of work with a therapist. So it's not like I woke up and I was like, I don't care what trolls think, you know, but I do think that there is an element of self identifying through the eyes of other people in the entertainment industry when like it matters so much to us what people think not only because our reward center gets lit up by laughter or applause or any of that stuff but also because our careers depend on people's opinions of us sure and that's yep. not just an audience that's also you know, the studio heads or directors, you know, and it could be silly things like, well, I didn't get that role because I look like the director's high school sweetheart who broke his heart, you know, but that doesn't make it any easier for us to sort of live through that. So the constant sort of rejection that we face as actors in the entertainment industry, you know, because I think people think it's like 90% success and 10% struggle. And it's really the other way around. It's 90% yes. struggle and 10% <laughs> success. And so I, I think, you know, once I got to the point where I was like, you know what, my ego is not as important as what I'm fighting for. And once I came to that conclusion, the trolling, it was less important to me. And then also, you know, I have very supportive people in my life, supportive friends, supportive family. My husband's incredible as far as really being terrified because of the death threats that I've received, but also being like, you know what, this is part of who she is and she's going to have to do it. And I know that what she needs right now is support and not his own fear of what is transpiring. I would be terrified every day. When you talk about the heartbreak, that perseverance. How do you keep going? I think for me, the thing that, that keeps it all in perspective is like, how can I be of service in this moment? You know, I mean, there's things that like Mark Ruffalo does that I'm like, I could never do that in his activism. And that's okay because Mark Ruffalo is doing it. Yeah. I think it's just amazing what you do. I don't know where I would even begin. So we all have to feel like we can contribute in the way that we can. And I think what you do is really important and you should feel that power. And then, you know, you're so young. There could be a day where you wake up and you could be like, you know what? Fuck it. I cannot be quiet a second longer because whatever, the injustice is something that I can't bear another minute. And when that happens, you call me and I'll hold your hand through it. Oh, my God. It, it's super hard. I love you so much. <laughs> it's super hard. You let me know. You said something on your podcast, Sorry, Not Sorry, about not ever wanting to talk shit or disparage anyone. And I really admire that. Mm -hmm. I believe you said that it just fundamentally isn't isn't you. Would you speak a little bit about that? Sure. I think for who I am as a person, and if I'm going to stay true to that, 
I'm always going to stand on the side of kindness. And it's kind of maybe even my protection mechanism of I never want to feel like I went down a road that I can't walk back from. Yeah. And I think that that is important. And I think that that's a barometer that's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. But I also feel that there is an element, you know, with social media that it just makes it so easy for people to lash out, people even that you might know. And I think that that's really hard. And I think that it's heartbreaking. But the social media should be an extension of who we are as people. And so as a person, I'm always going to err on the side of kindness. I never want to bring anybody pain, especially someone that seems like they are in pain already, which is normally why people lash out. So I try to deal with it as respectfully as possible. I mean, you know, my followers who have been following me on like Twitter for a while, they know that if there's a moment that I'm upset, I usually tweet, be well and God bless you and yours. And that's like, that's like my prayer for not only this person, but also for myself to sort of get past that moment in a place of kindness. It's not always easy. It really isn't. Yeah. But also, like, you know, especially when you're dealing with political ideology, it's important to remember that everyone feels a certain way because of their own struggle or what they've experienced in their life or how they've felt ignored by a certain party. Or sometimes it's just like the household they were raised in. And I think that that's important to remember, especially since we need to have empathy in our relationships with ourself and with strangers. We need to have compassion because otherwise I don't know why any of us do what we do. I mean, I would just not get out of bed. I would literally be like, okay, I'm just going to stay in bed. And when social media is not a thing anymore, I'm going to get out of bed. And also, like, when you think about the importance of having compassion and empathy in a life of service— And I think the great elected officials, and by the way, there are very few from either side that I would say are great, but the great ones never forget that progress doesn't stem from being divisive. Progress happens when you're able to communicate and see other people's perspectives and how they and why they think the way they think. That is a beautiful message and so important to remember. The whole goal should be to make people's lives easier. That's what activism is all about. So if we're holding so much animosity towards the other side and continuing to sow division, we're not going to get anything done. Completely. My point is just this. Like, when I was a little girl, the people that I idolized were people like Audrey Hepburn, Jane Fonda, Danny Kaye, Roberto Clemente. You know, my parents were a direct result of the civil rights movement. And so all of that is just to say that I was in the business at an age where it was encouraged for people to use their voices. And I started activism because I kissed Ryan White, who is HIV positive, on TV to prove that you couldn't get HIV AIDS from casual contact when I was 15 years old. I heard you tell this story, and it is just remarkable. You want to talk about getting trolled, and it wasn't on social media. It was hate mail or people screaming things at me when they saw me in public. And so I don't think I've ever lived a time in this industry where, or when I came up in this industry, where it wasn't frowned upon. And then I think there was a certain point where people were like, I don't know if it was before 9-11 or after 9-11 where people were like, you know, you probably shouldn't be so vocal. And I think the people who started later who weren't, you know, 1982 already working, which (laughs) I was, which is why I'm exhausted. But anyway, so, so, you know, I think that we were, and if you look at like Mark Ruffalo's 50, like Patricia Arquette, You know, so when you look at the people who are vocal still in this industry, it's people that were brought up in a time before it was frowned upon to do something. And I don't know if it was a studio thing where people were asked to keep their mouths shut or if it was a um, 
publicist thing. There's something to do with that machine. And I think, do you ever go back and look at like red carpet pictures? Like people who would walk the red carpet in the 80s or 90s, nobody had a fucking stylist. (laughs) Nobody had hair and makeup teams. (laughs) You got to really identify who a person was by those red carpet appearances, right? Because you could go, oh, look at her. She's quirky. Yeah. Like she wears big glasses, right? And then all of a sudden, it seemed like there was a machine and a um, a perspective that we needed to fit into where we needed to be polished. Like people created images, basically, of what their thought of who you are, were. I mean, and if you look at my career, it's like girl next door that people created that I had nothing to do with. And then all of a sudden it was the 90s where it was all about getting me to take my clothes off. Mm -hmm. So I get it. I get we've never really been in control of our own image. But I think there was definitely a certain point where our individuality was at least celebrated. And I don't know that that is true anymore. Like, I don't know that you know more about huge stars by the way they are on a red carpet. I think it fits into the image that someone has created for them. Alyssa, how old were you when you first fell in love? My first love, I was 15 to 18. It's my first boyfriend. You know, of course, that was a love that was relative to my capacity to love at that time, which has Mm -hmm. evolved so much. But yeah, I would say 15 to 18 was my first boyfriend that I loved very much. And then the love after that, I feel as though was reflective of who I was at that time. Can you describe that difference? With my first love, I think it was less romantic and more like... I feel safe with this person. My life is so crazy. Here's some stability. And that's what I needed at that time. But as I think about the people I have loved in my life, like romantic love, it evolved. And sometimes it wasn't even an evolution of where I was at personally, but where I was trying to get to. Like, I always did this really annoying thing. I'm sure it seemed really annoying to people that I was in relationships with. But because I lived such a sheltered life being in the industry, I didn't have friends my own age. I didn't go to school. So in my 20s, I felt like I fell in love with people who had specific passions and different passions, like could have been music or someone that loved to golf or whatever it was. And then I tried to learn everything I could about what they loved so much. And I never focused on the things that I potentially loved. I think that's so common. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's all part of the process of figuring out what you need in a relationship, for sure. But my relationship with my husband, who I've been with for 16 years, which is, I mean, I was the person that really couldn't have relationships for more than like four months after that first big one. Why do you think that was? To just get to the point where I was like, you know what? And if it wasn't four months, then it would be nine months. Those seem to be my, my, see the four months or nine months. It was for different reasons, for different reasons. You know, I just didn't want to waste my time knowing that it wasn't something that was right for me, right? And that went both ways. I mean, I've had my heart broken many times. But when I met my husband... How did you meet? Do you mind my asking? Of course not. I dated his best friend and roommate and coworker. (laughs) For how long did you date his roommate? Four months. And then what happened? And how did you guys end up... David was my confidant during that time. So whenever this other guy was, you know, being a jerk, I would go to David and I'd be like, I don't know, you know, because David lived in his guest house. And there were nights that I would just fall asleep on Dave's couch. We just became such good friends. And then I broke up with the guy. And Dave and I just remained friends and buddies. And then, I don't know, maybe about a little over a year of that kind of friendship. And you know that thing that people say when they're friends with people first, where it's like, I don't know, I just looked at them and they looked different. That's exactly what happened with me and Dave. I'll never forget it. I was living in West Hollywood. He was in the area. He came and he brought me ice cream. You got to ask him how hard he was crushing on you (laughs) tonight. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) I'll ask him. But yeah, I opened the door and I was just like, oh, and I saw him differently. And I, I think through my relationship with him, I realized 
so many of the cliches that we identify as parts of love were just fucking bullshit. Like, love means never having to say you're sorry. (laughs) Love is that you are in a constant state of sorry. Yeah, exactly. That you need to say that more than ever. Right. It (laughs) means that you, you fuck up, you apologize for it, and you fuck up less the next time. And love also means that they know your intentions and that they're going to accept your apology. But it makes you think of, like, who was trying to not say they were sorry for something? That that became such a cliche. Love means never having to say you're sorry. Like, were they conditioning us to not, you know? Like, what is that? Or also, like, I think about all the time, like, why when we get married do women have to take the dude's names? Like, what is that? At what point did we, you know, as a society or as human beings or the whatever it is, did we go, you know what, I'm going to take his name. I know I worked really hard to work on who who I am, but I'm going to take his name. I know, like, my parents and generations of trauma and turmoil got me to this point right now, but I'm going <laughs> to leave all of that behind and take his name. I completely agree. And I love being married. But I was thinking for younger generations, I was thinking like, is there going to be a shift? What gives me hope is social progression in that way. Mm -hmm. The tiny little steps, I think. Yeah, and it has to happen in a social way before everything else catches up. And I think that's important. Alyssa, do you feel like talking with Peter? I love it. All right. Let's do it. Hi, Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi, Anna. How are you? Hi, Alyssa. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Peter, thank you so much for writing in. Will you tell us what's going on? Yes. um, I'm divorced. I live in the greater Portland area. I actually live in Vancouver, Washington. Mm. And I moved up here about six years ago for a job. And I enjoy the job very much. It's been going very well. But I haven't found many women to date up here. Uh, The women up here are beautiful like everywhere. But I just haven't found many that appeal to me. I've only had a few dates up here. Mm. Uh, Before the pandemic, I used to go down to the San Francisco Bay Area every other month. That's where I'm from originally. And see family and friends. And I usually meet people when I travel. So you're like, I'm ready for love. How do I find it? Exactly. Um, I was married, like being married, just not to my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Sure. laughs> I go on the dating sites, but in the Bay Area, there was much more going on. Here, it's the same women on all the sites, and it's probably the same men on all the sites. And we're all looking at each other going, you know, where's our one? <laughs> Peter, when did you get divorced? How long ago? Oh, it was a long time ago. I think 2005 was when it actually went through. I'd actually met a woman in 2008, and I th- we thought we were going to get married. She didn't live near me. She was going to move to where I was, but she got very ill with this chronic illness, and mm. I didn't care. I wanted her to come anyway. I was in love, mm. but she just didn't want to put the burden on me, and there's nothing I could do to convince her, so we just parted ways. It was very sad for me. Mm. Peter, can I just, I mean, first of all, the vibe that I am getting from you is that you are a warm, kind man, and so the thing that popped into my head first was Well, actually, there's a silly thing and then like a more serious, a more serious thing. The more serious thing is maybe you want to go volunteer somewhere because then you can show someone, you know, your kindness and your big heartedness. And being able to meet someone in that capacity also allows them to see that part of you, but you to see that part of them, which I think because of your warmth that that should be equally as important. Yeah, I have volunteered over the years at various places and nothing, I mean, I enjoy the volunteering, but nothing really came of any of it in terms of a relationship. And it's not that I was out there looking for a relationship. I was just out there, you know, looking to help. Uh, So let's hear the silly idea. (laughs) What about taking like some kind of like ballroom dancing class? 
Okay, technically ballroom dancing. No, I did that with my ex-wife. <laughs> oh, you did? And she's my ex- well before we got married, and so you're good. Oh, well, I, I'm good yeah, with the ballroom exactly. dancing. Uh, we were having a little problem, and the teacher uh, actually danced with each of us a little bit and turned to my ex and said, "Stop leading." <laughs> and I think that was that sort was of like a, the emblematic, like yeah, that was a pretense <laughs> of what was coming up in the years to come that <laughs> finally reared its ugly head. Anyway. Ballroom dancing, I don't know. Other things I try to do, I do meditation online, the group. I've gone, actually, Vancouver, Washington. Um, I don't know when the last time you were here, Anna, but downtown before the pandemic really was a charming place to be. Mm. And I lived downtown, and I knew all the pubs, and I knew all the people. But after four years of that, I, that, that scene got a little tiring as most right. of the people were so much younger than me, you know, and I sort of cut down my group here to just a few people. Do you work from home? Yes. If you see somebody that you're drawn to, let's say at the grocery store, would you feel comfortable going up to them and complimenting them or how does... I'm not really shy that way. If there's a moment that I can take and make a comment, like such as the grocery store or something similar... I've approached uh, women and one became a friend for a short while and, and that didn't go through, but... Do you feel like technology in this time, the Zoom generation that we're in, has made it easier or more difficult? Well, you know, I've thought about that and it's really hard to say because I grew up dating, you know, in the 70s and the 80s and it was all face-to-face then. I knew very few people who actually took out an ad in a paper, although some people did. And now that I'm back in it and I'm going online, at first I thought, oh, this is so easy. I'm seeing all these women online that I'd like to get to know. And I had lots of dates when I first started. And they were all very nice, all very lovely. It's just, it wasn't going to be long-term, you know. And I'm definitely looking for a long-term relationship. And when you were dating, was that through the apps? Sometimes. When I first got divorced... I started looking out there, and, you know, it was all yeah, sort of yeah. like scary. But exciting. Yeah, scary, <laughs> but you're exa- exactly right. Exactly Ooh. right. And it was still rather, you know, women would say, oh, I don't want to send my picture through the internet and things like that. So I kind of understood it because this was back talking about 2005, something like that. So I actually started a singles group. And we met every other Friday night at a different bar And I met a lot of great people through there, and I dated a couple of them through there. You know, I'm a big believer in finding love through other friendships, you know? And I'm just wondering, what is your circle like? Have you said, you know, do do you have anyone to fix me up with? Because I can't even imagine. Thank God I got married before those apps, because I can't even imagine what I would have been like on those apps. I know. Peter, this is where we're very unqualified. I'm the same as Alyssa. We do hear a lot about them, though. So I do have some thoughts. And I love it that you started a singles group. Yeah, that's brilliant. Would you think about doing that again? Possibly. It's really funny. Like I said, the first four years I was living in downtown and I made a lot of friends, a lot of just like casual friends that the only time you see them is when they go into the pub and stuff. But after four years, I realized they were all on average so much younger than me. They didn't get my references. (laughs) And I thought, you know, I need to find more my crowd. And it seems the people my age I know here are all married and want to do married things. Right. I wonder if you can find a singles group that is more focused on like activities. So there would be less pressure. I don't know if you know Meetup, meetup meetup.com. This is part of my problem why I'm so unqualified, (laughs) Peter. In any event, um, (laughs) there's a website called meetup.com. And what it is, is people who create groups in different regions, and this goes all over the world. So you put in like, I'm in the Portland greater area, and I'm interested in, you know, books, reading books, and then it'll pull up all the groups that have to do with reading books or with singles, or with 40-plus or 50-plus singles. And the thing about it is, is that you get to say what you like to do and, you know, go meet people who have similar interests. I think that's half the battle. Exactly. And I've done some groups where I've had similar interests. It wasn't to go out and meet someone, but just some similar interests. I went to a 
plus 50 group one time. And they took the plus very, very seriously when I saw some walkers there. Peter, you know, when I talk to listeners about the dating apps and how essentially I mostly talk to women about them and essentially the consensus seems to be these make me feel bad. Mm. What makes them feel bad, though? I think because of, you know, just sort of instant rejection or... It's not dissimilar to how I felt, I think, at, you know, 14, looking at a 17 magazine, where it's like, this is fascinating to me, but I just kind of physically feel a little bad about myself. But having said that, I think you're in a different place. And I wonder if it's not worthy of another shot. You know what? I'm on some, and I look at it, as my friend said, she she looks at it too. She says, sometimes... It's just to pass the time because you go through so many profiles. So I do that. And every once in a while, I find uh, someone that appeals to me and I click. But lately, nobody's gotten back to me. But it's the same women on all the apps around here. And I'm sure it's the same men. But when I was in the Bay Area, of course, you got a much wider group of people, uh, more diverse. Do you think that if you were in the Bay Area that you would have found love by now? I don't know if I would have found love, but I certainly would have been on more dates Mm. and met more women. Yeah, I really believe that. I think that people are still starting to emerge. People are still a little shell-shocked from not being social in the way that we were. Mm -hmm. You think so? I do. I think as you start to get more acclimated to not only this new area, but also, you know, I think Anna's right, the resurgence of being social, I think you're going to have a lot easier time. And I think it's really important for you to spend time doing the things that you love for you and that someone's got to fit into that. And you'll find someone with similar interests more so if you continue to do the things that fulfill you. I agree. And Peter, would you consider yourself a pretty quick judge? I can be, um, but I also know enough that you don't necessarily judge on your first impression. Well, that's good that you're not judgmental. I've heard a lot of that, like something minor will turn somebody off without kind of seeing the whole picture. I also want to just touch on something you said before, which was that you feel that some of the people that are surrounding you are too young for where you are in your life. But I have to tell you, my husband is 10 years younger than I am. We've been together for 15 years. Actually, 10 years is not that much to me. Oh, that's good. Okay. I think part of it is just meeting someone who's at the same point in their life and wanting the same things as you do. Exactly. And I've been out there really trying to do that. It's just this area doesn't seem to be that great for me. Um, Although I love living in Vancouver. I love my home. I bought my house uh, a little over two years ago. And I wanted people to know where I, where I lived because everybody knew I lived downtown. It was easy to find. But I wanted people to know where I lived out here. So I started these once a month Friday evenings and I invited a bunch of people I knew. But if I was downtown in a bar and I was just maybe just talking to the person next to me and all oh, I'm new to the area or just someone new I met, I would invite them. And they were all like, they get all excited. They picked mm. up my information. A lot of people came, but not the people that I was like opening myself up to just maybe just for that evening or something. And I was a little bit disappointed because I met some people and I got, gee, you know, I think this person, we could really be friends and they would never follow up. It's hard to expand your circle. Like there's a comfort zone, I think. And anyone looking for love is basically saying, I am willing to take the risk to be a little uncomfortable. So, I mean, you should give yourself some credit in that respect that what you're doing and what you're putting out there right now is almost half the battle. I agree. You mentioned in your letter that you travel often for work. Have you thought about looking into travel groups, you know, for fun? One thing I found is I don't care to travel with large groups or even small groups. I did to Morocco and I was happy I did that. But I also it reinforced that I'd rather just be traveling with one other person. You get a third person in there and already you're starting a little trouble possibly. It depends on the people, obviously. But I met a lot of young couples who went to Europe to backpack like me and they broke up like in the first couple of weeks. It's worth at least exploring. You're absolutely right. Do you know that thing that they say, though, that if you're looking for it too hard, you're not going to find it? 
That's why I've given up <laughs> a little bit, you know. I think it's nurturing and nourishing your own soul so that when you do meet that right person, you are able to connect in a way where you know who you are, you know what you're looking for. And so I think you just keep working on yourself. You seem awesome. You seem warm and caring. And so I have no doubt that you're going to find someone. Oh, thank you. Peter, I hope it's of comfort to know that you're not alone in what you're feeling. And I think it's important to have an open mind and an open heart in all of the interactions that you have. Maybe you'll meet someone at the grocery. Maybe you'll meet someone at baggage claim. Yeah. Well, I'm going to the United Emirates and Oman starting next week. Oh, amazing. Maybe when I come back, I'll also look into more uh, volunteering opportunities. I think this trip is perfect timing. I think you're going to come back with a totally different perspective on probably what you're even looking for. Yeah. And the beauty is that I know that the tech aspect of all of this is really hard, but it does kind of open up the door to you finding someone who's not in your area, who, you know, that you connect with. I'm open. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Peter, I can't thank you enough. And have a wonderful trip. Thank you so much for having me. You're very sweet. Open heart and mind. Open heart and mind. Exactly. You you, you got it. Bye, Peter. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye now. Take care. I do find that, though, that a lot of people right now are putting a lot of pressure on themselves to get things figured out, to make these big decisions in life. I think because of the fact that if they hadn't found someone before the pandemic and they spent a good chunk of time alone, I think, you know, you're able to reflect and be like, I'm lonely and I don't want to be lonely. And it's time that I get serious about finding someone to love. And I totally get it. You know, I think it's just important for people to not lose sight of who they are in the process and become so obsessed with with the mission. Yes, I think you're completely right. Yeah. Not weighing everything very well sometimes. Alyssa, you're just wonderful. You're wonderful. It's my honor to be with you, truly. Okay, now we're going to talk with Vanessa. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? We are great. Your letter is fascinating. Will you tell us what's going on? Yes. And I actually wrote it down because I didn't want to get too flustered. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I have some issues with my mother-in-law. And to give some context, my husband and I got married at the courthouse in 2017. And we had a public ceremony in 2018. And at our courthouse ceremony, my mother-in-law told us we had to keep it a secret because people would be mad. And I don't know why, but we ended up going along with it. <laughs> And then after three years on our true anniversary in 2020, we decided to tell everyone our actual wedding day. After my mother-in-law found out about that, she yelled at me saying things like, I only care about myself and I never think about anyone else's feelings. I gave myself time to cool down and decided to send her a text ultimately saying that it was our day and it's none of her business as respectfully as possible. I even had my mom and my husband read it before sending in to make sure it wasn't mean. And she never responded. And I took a few months away from family functions because of it. She proceeded to act like nothing ever happened after that, and I just let it go, keeping her at a distance. In the past couple weeks, she ended up telling my husband that she doesn't like my family because she thinks they're trashy. Lovely. (laughs) Yes. He actually (laughs) vented to me about this instance since I wasn't there, and the next day she acted like nothing ever happened again. So I just really don't know how to deal with her now, and any kindness she does show seems fake. Oh, boy. Okay. (laughs) So this has been ongoing for quite a while. Yes. Three or four years. Yes. And she says other things, but these were the two big instances. And it seems like your husband is really supportive. Yes. Of you. Absolutely. Yes. So your your relationship with your husband is solid. Yes. I always say that he brings out the best in me, but she kind of brings out the worst in me. And what does he do when things like this come up? Does he speak with her about these issues and how they make you feel as sort of like the mediator? Yes, he does say stuff, but she kind of just lets it go and doesn't say anything ever again and acts like nothing ever happened. 
Well, this may not sound super relevant, but has your husband mentioned, like, has she been a little hateful towards other girlfriends that he's had? I have heard her say that she really hated his ex-girlfriend and that she thinks she was crazy. Good news. It's not just <laughs> yes. you. <laughs> yes. That's a great point. It's a great point. I mean, maybe she's just doesn't like her son's attention to be given to a woman that he loves. Not that it makes it right. But, you know, sometimes when you break things down to, like, their most fundamental level, you wind up having a little bit more compassion for the situation. So are these conversations on text or happening face-to-face? The one about the wedding, that was face-to-face. And then I sent a text afterwards because I can get my words better in writing. But then the one where she called my family trashy, it was to my husband's face because I wasn't there. Oh, man. I mean, that that's just unacceptable. That is just totally and completely unacceptable. Just like it would be unacceptable if you were talking shit about his family. Everybody has differences. Sometimes we marry into differences. And we have to respect all of that. But I would just advise, because any situation we've gotten into in my family with, like, my mom or Dave or Dave's parents or whatever has always had the foundation of it being misconstrued based on text messages and not being able to hear tone When you're reading something, so it's too easy for us to project what we think their tone is. Does that make sense? Yes. So definitely try not to text people about this. The conversation should definitely happen Mm face-to-face. How frequently do you have to see her? It seems like every few weeks we go to birthday parties and stuff. (laughs) They have a big family. They have a big family. Okay. Do you have kids? No, not yet. Because that's going to add a whole other thing onto this. Not yes, to scare it sure you. will. <laughs> yes, I am worried about that. Yeah. Okay. My advice, and Alyssa, tell me if you think I'm totally off base, and it's not going to be very fun. Because she, well, she lives in, like, I feel like a bitterness stew. Like, if it's not you, it would be somebody else. And she seems like she is in very much of a habit of shit talking. Like that's her comfort place for whatever unfortunate reason. Mm -hmm. It's tough. Like, I don't know if in your circumstance, if you can bring up, hey, that time that you yelled at me was totally inappropriate. Well, first of all, it was. It's not her business. Right. She shouldn't be dictating any rules in your life. So just know that. But I wonder if you almost take a totally different approach. What if every time you're together, you were overly warm? Like you work in customer service and you just pretend to be really happy to see her. I'm sure she feels your distance. Yeah, I'd say so. I've been lucky in the mother-in-law arena, but my sweet mom, my brother has been married a few times. And I know that she was always like, you know, she oftentimes speaks before she thinks she has very strong feelings that she doesn't always like stick to. And I've attempted to be kind of an ally for my sister-in-laws, but I know that she probably hasn't been as generous as she could have been. But do you think you could try that tactic? I think I could. (laughs) It'll take her by surprise. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you can do that and say to yourself while you're doing it so you don't feel like, because I know part of your issue is you feel like she's being fake sometimes, that maybe if you look at it as now is the time to heal whatever this is, because hopefully you're going to have children if that's what you choose to do. And so really you're setting the groundwork for when she's your child's grandmother and to be able to heal her by allowing her into your family and she's able to say wow look at what my look at what my son's doing here like i'm really proud of this this is incredible that's not going to say that she's not going to try to like you know you should put the baby down at this time and you know all of those things but i'm just wondering if you can look at this exercise as trying to heal the rift before you bring another soul into the mix. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Because 
things are going to get more complicated, but also that's when you need you need more help, you need more family support, and continue to take the high road for sure. Yes. I would give you different advice, I think, if your husband wasn't supportive. But the fact that he is means you guys have your unit. And so you could try mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. very openly, like, just plaster that smile on your face and receive her with so much warmth that she won't know what to do exactly. But she certainly won't be able to talk that much shit about you. For a while now, she's probably been thinking that you don't like her very much. And so therefore, she doesn't like you, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, because that's how human brains, that's how we work. And if you actively tried to shift that, then we don't know what the results will be. It'll test you, though. You might have to practice a little bit. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. For sure. This conversation, Vanessa, made me think about this quote that I really love that I just looked up on my phone because I wanted to share it with you. I hope it's helpful. It's some people will hate you when they see in you what's missing in them, and they will try to pick you apart for it because that's just easier than them working on themselves. I like that. And that's from Arch Hades. And I think it's important. Some people will hate you when they see in you what's missing in them. And in this case, it might be your son. Yeah. It might be your son. I mean, that might be the one, the thing that's missing in her in her that you have. And so there are no easy answers, though. The marrying of two families is a dynamic that it's really astonishing if it ever works well. Yeah, I agree. My other advice, I would tell your husband, like, the advice that I gave you about, like, almost playing a character. And hopefully he'll be like, yeah, all right, let's see how that goes. I find that if I vent too much to too many people, it just kind of compounds things. It intensifies in me. Such a great point. I feel like it becomes just so concentrated and I feel like I have to be proactive. So I would give you permission to vent to like two people on occasion. Does he have siblings? Yes, he does. Vanessa, do you get the feeling that your husband is her favorite? Yes. (laughs) Oh, man. This is heavy lifting on your end, but I think you can do it. Like, just fucking kill her with kindness, you know? Yeah. I mean, the worst that could happen is that she could continue to, for whatever reason, judge you and your family unfairly, you know? Yeah, it can only get better by you putting in an effort and out of respect for yourself and your husband and her. It's worth to continue to work on it, especially if you're planning on having children. Yeah, you're playing the long game. For sure, there's going to be moments when she does or says something and you'll never want to see her again. But try to kind of be just above it. Like, instead of being upset or angry, try being, I don't know, amused. And you'll have to be really patient. How does all of this sound? I like it. And I don't think there's many options in this situation. Yeah. And if it works, everyone kind of wins. But what a blessing you are that you're yes wanting to make this better. And hopefully she'll see that and respond to that. And your ability to have empathy and compassion for her is an important part of this. And I feel that you do. And that's why you're working on it, which is great. Thank you. It's not easy, I know. Yeah. Adulting is hard. It (laughs) sucks to not ever get an apology, but it's part of our journey, you know, as humans, that there will be some itches that will never be scratched. I am really happy, though, that you love your husband and that you can talk to him about this. You know what you have in your heart and what you can do. And I have complete faith. I mean, just for you to even write in to on a show means that you want to make a difference in your relationship with her. And that's, that's beautiful. I really appreciate all your help. I hope that you see a different side of her. I hope that she can shift. I hope that for her. Me too. Me too. You got this. Love, warmth, enthusiasm, compliments, questions. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Take care, darling. Bye, Vanessa. 
Alyssa, I can't thank you enough. So happy to be with you. Feel so blessed for this opportunity to spend a few minutes with someone that I admire. Thank you so much. It was truly an honor to have you. Bye. 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 